In the heart of the state of the art, at the dawn of the next stage in entertainment, you found no proscenium. You have indeed found No Persinium, the voice of everything immersive. I'm your host, Noah Nelson, and welcome to episode 395. This week, a true rarity, a sequel. This week, we're following up on last week's mini-sode with a conversation with my former colleague, entrepreneur and technologist Kurt Collins, about just what Apple is really up to with the Vision Pro. Kurt, who is... Full disclosure, a sustaining backer of the pod, Kurt and I go back over a decade. Back when I was at Youth Radio up in the Bay Area, he's one of my favorite people to talk tech with. And indeed, this started out as a text (laughs) message between the both of us. We'll get into all of that. Also, uh, there's some there's some edits for cats and phone calls and just this is a real 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 live and raw one and i i think i got all the cats meowing out of the the audio uh so get ready to settle in for some high level nerdetry that also touches on the way technology shapes culture because that's what we do around here Another thing we do around here is give shout outs to those who help make our dreams a reality. And there's a lot of that going on right now. Uh, The way Meow Wolf did with the next stage earlier this month. Reality being the operative word because reality is unreeling at Meow Wolf's latest permanent exhibition titled The Real Unreal, opening July 14th in Grapevine, Texas, deep in the heart of the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex. Meow Wolf Grapevine will be the fourth location for the arts and entertainment company known for creating transformative, interactive experiences of story and exploration for all ages. You're probably wondering if tickets are on sale, and yes, they are. And yes, you should buy them now at meow.wf slash grape. If you still want to know what a Meow Wolf is, try getting lost at Santa Fe's House of Eternal Return, Las Vegas' Omega Mart, or Denver's Convergent Station, where curiosity reigns supreme and familiar spaces lead to spectacular worlds made out of weird art that are still somehow for everybody. A Meow Wolf experience is innovative, imaginative, In other words, too, the new exhibition will open in Grapevine Mills, a shopping mall already featuring a range of experiential offerings. In addition to groundbreaking installations, the Real Unreal will expand on the Meow Wolf story universe while following a tradition of engaging local artists to build out an accessible, explorable multimedia space. And just like the previous three locations, Grapevine will offer a unique experience, as will Meow Wolf's upcoming exhibition in Houston. So, if you're immersed in Meow Wolf's distinctive brand of storytelling, Texas holds the keys to the next chapters. If this is your first time hearing about Meow Wolf, though, don't worry. There's no right or wrong way to enjoy the art or engage with the stories. Book your tickets for The Real Unreal today at meow.wf slash grape. Thanks again to Meow Wolf for helping bring the next stage to this reality. And they're not the only ones we have to thank this week. Our incredible Patreon backers keep this show and everything we do alive and kicking. And that includes our latest backer, Sean O'Connell. Remember, as little as $2 a month makes a difference to us. Hitting up patreon.com slash no proscenium not only powers the podcast and websites for no pro and everything immersive... It also gets you into our member-only Discord. In fact, we've been scheduling backer-only and professional hangouts in the Discord, weaving together our community a little tighter over coffee. Something I've been getting myself up early for. If you're already a backer, don't forget to link your Patreon account to Discord and drop a review on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. You'd be surprised. That helps. Sharing the articles you find useful on your social media platform of choice helps immensely. We are always no proscenium, except on Insta, where we are no underscore proscenium. As always, big thanks to our sustaining backers, Samuel Mustry, Chris Woolman, Samantha Davison, Eric Shamlin, Elaine, Daryl, John Boulet, Jay Bushman, Jerome Joseph Gentis, Tom Leonetti McGuire, Kurt Collins... We're talking to this week. Winthorne, Ryan, David Bassick, Richard Ayers, Lonnie Hanson, Lecker LeCool, the Ministry of Peculiarities, and Jan Budman. And hey, 
if you are a business looking to get like shout out space on the pod or in some other form, we have ways of doing that. Uh, we are we are open for that. Uh, also, if you're maybe running an event or you have a venue and you're looking to work out a special deal for our backers, um, that's another way uh, to get things going on here. Hit me up at noah at noprosinium.com for details. That's the way to work out a deal. Uh, and uh, the door the door is definitely open to it because uh, uh, we have bills to pay. And that's that's a way to pay them. All right. With that all said and done, uh, strap yourself in. Uh, <laughs> I talk a lot in this episode. I was editing it last night. I'm like, man, shut up, Noah. Uh, so there you go. Uh, it's me, a lot of me. <laughs> And it's Kurt Collins, who uh, is really cool. And uh, I, th- I, think, I think you're all about to have, uh, have a good time listening to this. Now, you don't have to be uh, a sustaining backer of the show to get a special segment of the podcast. <laughs> And indeed, not every single one of them, sorry to break you to you, could pull this gag. But Kurt Collins, entrepreneur and technologist, who I've known for, I don't even want to say how long now. It's been a while. Like, it's been, it's been a while. It's been a while. Uh, I know Kurt from our, our days at Youth Radio. Uh, I met him when uh, he was, you were teaching, was it Oakland Tech you were teaching kids at? Actually, um, I had started a nonprofit called the Hidden Genius Project um, yeah. to teach young black men how to code. It's now served over 7,000 kids in, the, yeah. in 10 years. Uh, and 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 he he connected with us at Youth Radio, and, and we became fast friends because we're both tech nerds. And uh, Kurt far more than me because he actually knows how to code, an engineer, and does the entrepreneurial thing. And these days he's in Lisbon, uh, exploring exploring uh, that city. And uh, we he listened to the the little mini sode I did about uh, Apple Vision Pro and hit me up on text. And, uh, at a certain point I'm like, wait a second, we're burning pod. Like we need to, (laughs) we need to do this as the podcast instead. Um, and, and I'm excited for you guys to meet Kurt because he is one of my favorite people to talk, not talk, not just talk tech with because tech, tech is all well and good in and of itself to like nerd out about the engineering or the specs or whatnot. But the critical thing is what how tech interweaves with the culture and what tech does to culture and what it affords and what it creates uh, and how one's relationship to understanding how the technology works affects your standing in our society, um, which gets back to, you know, ultimately how we met, right? Cause you were, you were teaching young black men yeah. how to code. So all of that rolls into us uh, doing some more nerding out about Vision Pro and Kurt calling me on some stuff. So call away, Mr. Colin. <laughs> <laughs> so when I listened um, to the pod, to the mini sode last week, um, uh, I I felt a, a visceral urge to tell you that I thought you were wrong. <laughs> um, and this is what kicked this off. And actually, I don't, I, I now want to say that I think you and I are more aligned than um, than initially, but I wanted to have this conversation yeah. so that we could tease it out. Brilliant. So what what in the mini sode? Because we did have a little bit of a chat, like you know, in text. So we got to recreate that for everybody, right? We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stage the conversation. Yeah, but... <laughs> uh, start with start with the mini sode. Like where where did you where did you think that like I called it wrong? And I'm, and um, everybody, so, I'm not like, I'm not angry here, right? Like I may have a temper <laughs> that people don't know about, but I'm not like, like I'm, I'm, I'm in a Zen, I'm in a super Zen state about this. I guess I'll just, I'll just restate, you know, I think what I was coming out of that Apple announcement with out of, out of, out of what they did on that Monday was just kind of a profound sense of disappointment that they didn't talk about what makes spatial computing in a headset so interesting they spent a lot of time focusing on here's the things you can do that you already do but now you can do it on your face was sort of the message i was getting out of that and i know that the the 
there's such there's complexity around trying to sell this to people who haven't done it yet and i felt i felt like they had and i think i still feel this way that they had missed the mark on selling what was special about this to people and maybe they weren't even pitching down that lane so yeah and um i don't know that i completely disagree with you on the fact that they may have missed the mark on on how they pitched it to people but i also think that um so if you look back at Apple's launches, um, in particular, the one that I can probably compare this to would be the Apple Watch launch. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, when the Apple We're Watch both launched, wearing them, by the way. So uh, they, <laughs> Yes, we are. Yeah. <laughs> um, when the Apple Watch launched, Apple had no idea what people were going to actually do with this device. Right? Um, when the iPhone launched, they had some idea because smartphones had already been um, out there, not only in the U.S., but a lot in the EU. So there was some general idea about what the public would do with a smartphone. Um, in fact, the iPhones, uh, the iPhone's features and their specs were actually behind a lot of the smartphones that already existed. Just Apple put in a cool touchscreen and a couple other things. They did some fancy marketing and everything was, you know, suddenly it's the coolest phone on the planet. But when it came to the Apple Watch, it was very... Um, uh, Apple was putting it out there and trying to get people to spend, you know, what was a decent amount of money on a device that they were saying, you know, like, we don't really know what you're going to do with it yet. So let's just tell you kind of like what it, what, what, what exists, what exists now that's kind of comparable that you think you might want to do with it. And I feel like that's what Apple was doing with this launch because the Apple Watch eventually turned into a health device, right? Right. After a couple of years, they realized health is the way to go on this thing. Everybody's doing this to track their steps and all this other stuff. And they went deep down that rabbit hole. But it, t- it took them a couple of years of real world usage to focus in on that. And spatial computing is a thing that you and I know about because we're geeks. Um, but it is not a thing that anybody else like outside of the people who are used to wearing Vibes and or MetaQuest, whatever it is, right? Like outside of us, yeah. nobody knows. They, they, they look at it as like this virtual reality thing that all these gamers are doing and so on and so forth. Like Apple can't come at it from the perspective of selling us. They have to come at it from the perspective of explaining why this thing doesn't suck for the things that already exist in the world. Like I, I, I get that they're – that there's a, a bit of that. And, and I think you you have a really strong take I want, I want to get to about what it is this device is really doing in terms of the strategy. Because I think that that reframes what they just did last week, I think, in a big way. We'll, we'll get there. But I think watching that thing, what was funky as someone who's had one of these things on their face for a long time, was watching the pitch of, and you can watch Avatar in 3D the way it was meant to be seen. And I'm like, the absolute worst thing you can do in one of these things, I'm sorry, big screen, I'm sorry, every everybody, is watch a video. Like, and, and, for, and for me, it felt like this weird mixed message because Apple's like, we're going to put eye we're going to put fake eyes on the front of this thing so that you don't so that other people don't feel disconnected from you, right? Like this idea that like yeah. it's super isolating. And and yet at the same time, we're going to encourage you to watch a movie. And on the one hand, if like the pitch is like you're a traveling executive and the then the screen in the hotel room is not good enough for you. Strap on your Vision Pro and watch it in your own <laughs> private Mount Hood theater. It's like okay, cool. And at thirty five hundred dollars, yeah, it feels like something out of the Sharper Image catalog. But like, uh, shout out Sh- Sharper Image, we miss shout you. Sharper Image. Um, yeah, we do. Um, <laughs> so like. We, oh, I was like, oh, was that me? And I was like, no, that's definitely not it. That's that's not a Los Angeles siren. So don't. <laughs> I was like, what's that? Oh, don't worry about it. Um, I was like, that's funky siren. What's going on in my neighborhood? <laughs> um, I, I, Kurt's on his uh, AirPods. So there you go. Right. I mean, it's not like it's not like yes. Apple. It's not like Apple doesn't know their way around some of this stuff. And that was the thing for me. The thing that was that was shocking. Right. I was. I was getting so hyped during the WWDC up until the Vision Pro, because even though like showing like the the iPhone, you know, tap share to share a contact card, which has been around for like 10 years. Been around forever. Yeah. Ever. The fact that like the way they did it is like Apple, like the way Apple always does it. 
it's prettier, it's cooler, and it integrates with the whole system in a way that no one else could because they won't let anyone else do it that way. Mm -hmm. But then it was also the way they were showing off the AirPods and just how intelligent the AirPods are getting about uh, you know, pa- when to pass through sound and when not to pass mm-hmm. through sound. They also pointed out that Apple Park has a real leaf blower and marching band problem, which I think Tim Cook should look into immediately. That is, <laughs> I don't know why there are so many marching bands and leaf blowers there, guys. Like, that's a little weird. But like, um, and, and that was the thing. They were having fun. It was Apple at their most playful. And I was getting really set up because they were showing I think the one for me, the killer one, I think I mentioned this last week, was watching people do real-time collaborative sketching on an iPad in free form, which, mm-hmm. which for me, I was like, oh my God, they understand what shared spatial digital experiences are. Because for me, two people sitting down next to each other with an iPad – even even though it's not in the virtual spatial, that is spatial yeah. computing. That is creating yeah. a, a, a digital layer to reality and, and being able to collaborate that way. And yet we didn't see anything like the equivalent of tilt brush or gravity sketch. We didn't see we didn't see any creative tools in the Vision Pro thing. And and as someone who grew up, and again, this is my Gen X bias here, you know. Apple and Apple's definitely changed as a company, right? Apple is a consumer products company in a way that it never was in the nineties, right? In in a Mm -hmm. serious way. But in some ways this talks about that drift from the roots of Apple, which was Apple was the thing that the graphic designers used. Apple was the thing that the movie cutters used, right? Like that was the revolution. Every creative person, every creative person was using an Apple, a a Mac in the nineties and the eighties. Yeah, yeah, in the 80s and the 90s and up until the aughts. And mm-hmm. and the iPhone changed a lot of that math. And 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 yet now, like the M2s, we were talking about this before we started, like the M2s are so powerful. Like the chips, the chips are so incredible, what it's doing, what it affords, the affordances it makes. And to see no creative affordances, particularly when they're kind of pitching a pro, like it's like watch a movie and it's like I wanted to see finger painting, you know, like finger paint, yeah. so, just just something that that said this this goes a little bit beyond, particularly because you and I and the cat, we've seen all of this before on a five hundred dollar Facebook box. Right, which is the yeah. thing that that's the thing that gets to me is like there wasn't even tilt brush. But but so uh, my my concern, mm, I don't want people to think that I bleed Apple. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, we just all pay the tax all the time. So we, yes, we, yeah. I, do I do I buy a new iPhone for every year? Yes, but <laughs> do I bleed I used to Apple be that way? You know. <laughs> no, um, but but I think we also have to. I think we also have to um, allow them some some wiggle room here because um, they haven't gotten developers in yet. Like this was, yeah. Let's not forget this was WWDC. This was Worldwide Developer Conference, right? Like they, yes, it's a product announcement, but it's more of a product preview. Right. And like when the announcement truly comes, when this thing drops in Q1 of next year, I'm positive Apple's going to have another big event or something like that. Like they always, you know, they sometimes have a March or a February or a March event where they're going to announce this thing. And that's where you're going to see some more of these things, because right now, all they really could show you were the first party applications. Right. And that's not the stuff that you're really looking for. You're looking for devs to get in there now. Which is which was the start of this last week. The devs are going to get in there and they're going to spend the next like six nine months um, building something amazing. Apple's going to pay a couple of them and say, hey, "Listen, we'll give you prime placement and whatever announce that we do." And bam, you get the applications and the true launch that you're looking for. This was just to get developers interested. Well, well that was the thing that though that kind of boggled me was that they hadn't taken that a little bit of that step yet, yeah. and that there wasn't there wasn't something that showed off. I know you don't want to. The strategy seems to be actually. You know what? Tell let's go on there. Tell, the, tell let's go there. Tell the listeners what you wrote me that 
that I think reframes this in terms of what this device is actually heralding. Yeah. So um, there are, there are two schools of thought on what Apple's trying to do right now. And um, if you listen to Zuck and that side of the, that side of the tech field, a lot of people are saying, Oh, I don't know how this thing is going to take out um, meta. Um, I don't think I don't know how this thing is going to go after the Vive and so on and so forth because it's it's thirty five hundred dollars. It's a thirty five hundred dollar device, right? And um, and so like it's from a consumer perspective, that's a hefty amount of money to spend on what prior to last week people were saying was a gaming niche, right? Like virtual reality was a gaming niche. Yeah. Augmented reality hadn't really proven itself outside of like using google maps yeah. right some b2b so, stuff like, some military applications right and and yes, like and but, the hololens but not, not was like twenty five hundred dollars right so like ex- exactly and so so like most of this stuff isn't it's not it, it wasn't consumer focused from the perspective that i think apple's thinking about it was niche focused on gamers like me who are who are willing to drop six hundred dollars on a ps Four, six, PS5, and then another four. <laughs> yeah, right? The and PS6 another, another is not going to be that cheap, <laughs> man. Like, it's going to be. <laughs> um, and then another four or $500 on some VR goggles to go with it. When all of a sudden done, I would have dropped $1,500 total on my PS5, right? And so, like, um, it, sure, there are people out there like me who are going to be who are going to be willing to do that, but that's not the consumer market. Where I think Apple's going with this, I think they are trying to cannibalize their own Macintosh market right? Their own personal computer sales. And I think they're going after the personal computer market in the 15, in the 15 to 20 year time span, right? Like they want spatial computing to become the way you compute, to, to, to become the way you interact with the digital world, period. They don't want people on their laptops in the long term, right? They, won't, they don't want people on their Mac minis in the long term. They want that to become a smaller amount of the market. Um, and if you notice, uh, like just looking at um, just looking at PC sales, PC sales drops like 20, 25 percent year over year between 2021 and 2022. And that PC sales globally, not just like Macintosh stuff, right? Not just yeah. Apple stuff. And so like Apple's seeing the writing on the wall here that somehow people aren't going to be buying new PCs if they can just buy a phone. They're just not going to do it. Right. If they can just buy an iPad, why are they why are they going to buy why are they going to spend money on a PC? It, like in the long term, PCs are dead. What isn't dead, and this is why the M the M one and the M series platform um, is so power performant and efficient, is mobility. Mobility is not dead. Mobility is thriving. Something mm. that is a mobile device is the future. Nobody wants to be tied to a desktop if they can help it. Don't get me wrong. I love my Mac Mini. But um, if they can help it, that's not the primary device that they want. And I think Apple sees that 10, 15 years from now, the primary computing device they want in their vision, they want the primary computing device to be on your face. That's what they want. They want spatial computing to take over in that way. Now, are they going to succeed? I don't know. But that explains the $3,500 price point. They'll get that down. They'll get it down to two thousand. They'll they'll go from Vision Pro to Vision Mini and all the stuff that they normally do. They'll get a cheaper one out there. I'm not too yeah. concerned about the prices coming down, but they are not going after this like a traditional virtual reality device. They're going after this like a computer. With that framing, the way they rolled it out makes a lot more sense. Like the in the the looking back in Destiny's Garden, like there's only one path. Like, you know, 10 years from now we can look back and be like, oh, oh, they called it all along, right? You know, except for the bit where we'd be using Apollo because Apollo got killed the next week. <laughs> right. Which I was that was really ironic. Uh That's I was just, like, oh way to way to go guys. Um good, good job. Yeah, really good job in terms one. of what you're picking. <laughs> You know, um, but who knows? Maybe they got to made a pile already coded one up and uh, is going to gonna be there for the future. But um, for those of you who don't know, Apollo is a, cl- a mobile client for Reddit. Uh, and Reddit. Reddit. And that very, and Reddit is in the middle of a, 
jacking up their API prices just like Twitter did because now all the guys at the top of the tech stack think that they can do that in order to make the AI people pay their fair share. But guess what? The AI people already got what they needed. And instead, you're just killing off your developer uh, you know, <laughs> uh, environment, which, you know, if you kill off your developer environment, you're dead in the water. That's it. Uh, That's it. Way, way to go, guys. Yeah, it's it. You're, you're finished. You are you are finished. Doesn't even, even Apple knows this. Even Apple, who regularly cannibalizes <laughs> things from the developer community. Developers. Absolutely, in all fact, the time. they did that this like, time. They oh, this they time totally with did. The, with the journal. Day one? Day one? I'm, oh, looking yeah. at day, I'm looking at the journaling app, but I'm like, I'm sorry, day one. Like, we it's, knew this, this was coming, day one. Yeah. R.I.P. I, I'm surprised yeah. it took them this long. I was like, journal popped up, and so I was like, "Oh, that's day." I, I, first, I was like, "Did they buy day one? <laughs> did they? Did they do the honorable thing and buy them?" You know, no. it's like I use no. I use mail plugins, I use Mail Acton and all that stuff, and that's being killed because of the way they do it. So those guys are building their own mail app, and maybe I'll go over. We'll see. Um, but like, but sadly, the main reason I use it is just because it it, it just it's just it's muscle memory at this point, right? Like I paid them, I paid them money just to have the muscle memory of like hitting space bar in order to count something as red. So ridiculous, like how much one will spend (laughs) just for a simple freaking macro. Um, uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> hello, adult ADHD. Um, the point being <laughs> that, that this is what Apple does, right? Is and and mm-hmm. you know, seeding the developer community, letting the developer community build things out, and then uh, drawing that stuff back into the core functionality of the OS, drawing that stuff back in, and and yet at the same time, I think what you know, in some ways, what we're talking about here about that device being, give me one second. <laughs> Sorry, everyone, the cat was on. Um, what if, if indeed Apple's play here is we know the laptop is going to be dead. We know that the desktops and the pros, like for the pros, that's still going to be a thing for maximum power. So let's try and create a new category that becomes indispensable on the mobile level. Um, what I worry about is that the the incentive to create novel experiences, the incentive to really use the affordances of spatial, actually start to drop away because they are resource intensive. The uncanny valley effect, uh, you know, is you know in, in multiple dimensions is really hard to get over. Like I'll tell you, watching that FaceTime persona, uh, you know part of the demo i don't want to i don't want someone talking to a creepy digital you know corpse avatar of me yeah right i'd much rather have my memoji i'd rather have them talk to the cartoon lion that apple currently gives me to like send people annoying messages with via iphone right i'd rather do that (laughs) um i'm really good at it too uh i'd rather have that going on uh you know in, in much the way that the street to use a william gibson term has already showed that vtubers is a thing right like people and people like Uh particularly the kids, the kids love the avatars. Um, and and this idea, though, that weirdly enough, Apple's going to square this shit up uh, <laughs> and make it and make it safe for spreadsheets is is a little unnerving to me when when the thing that I am and, and my community, I think I can talk for my community, that what we're interested yeah. in are what these devices afford us in terms of a broader range of human expression, right? Like what's okay. interesting to me, okay. what's interesting to me about, you know, what, you know, the actors who were working on the under presents managed to do is they use that very limited tool that is the Oculus quest series that has no eye mm-hmm. tracking that, and, and in something like the under presents where they even removed voice from the participants so that what developed was a relationship between the performers and the participants where the performers were reading the very kind of crude body language that was that was um in tr- that was offered by hand position and head position and and then yeah. distance from person to person that those those little axes of information was enough to draw out a, 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 a an interpersonal language and and drive creative moments and 
that sort of thing where we start to broaden the expressive abilities and and sort of bring bring in spatial and and you and I have run around VR chat together we've run around we yeah. we've run around alt space back when alt space existed together. we didn't run around VR chat yeah. we, we should do that sometime um but even though these are very limited input tools we're still able to get a little bit closer to a natural you know relationship because of that spatial dimension and 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 I'm not I'm not seeing Apple be interested in that at the moment but wait, uh, okay, so um, let me put on my Apple apologist hat again um, for a second. and Do your and best point out Google that, like, impression right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's the thing, right? Like, to me, um, there, there were a few things that made me, um, one, disagree with your fear here. Mm-hmm. Um and one of the things that made me disagree with it, well, the two things that made me disagree with it was, this is the first device that we've seen that truly does some semblance of pass-through yeah. with, um, with like, amazing quality, right? And I All know the to, like, are that it's, like, you look at your hand and you feel like you're looking at your hand. Exactly, exactly, right? And, and like, and so that's incredible that's astounding for their first revision of this product mm-hmm. right like the, the basics are there they got the basic stuff right i you know like i don't i'm supposedly not feeling motion sick when i see this when i, when I see things um we can layer windows we can we can layer the virtual on top of the real with with realistic shadowing going on down there i mean like this is this is amazing stuff to put a win a virtual window up, put a shadow on an existing like on a countertop or on a table or something like that, making me feel like the two are there. Like that is incredible what they managed to do, and that's just the basics, right? And it's really really difficult for them to do that. Plus the eye tracking, and lastly, nobody's been able to pull off hand tracking yet. Yeah, nobody. Like everybody's tried, everybody's failed. And that's because everybody was going for the mass market. Apple has made a brand out of caring less about the mass market in the beginning, right? They eventually get down to the mass market, but they, they, they made a brand luxury out of brand. like, at, at the end of the day, brand. they're still a luxury brand. Exactly. So if somebody, if, if you want to put out, a $3,500 device that they know they're not going to sell to more than a million people in a year, right? Like that's their, that's their max. That's their cap on that. Yeah. We're you want to saturate the out. 1% and we're good. Exactly. We're Apple. Yeah. And, and we're okay. Right. And, but you better nail it. And everybody, every report that I've said, said that that hand tracking is amazing. Now for the experiences that you're talking about to be able to do a fine pinching movement anywhere in the space that you can see and have the device recognize that what other things will it be able to recognize in real time? Apple doesn't care about the other things it will be able to recognize because developers are going to care about that. Right. But showing off that all you need to do is pinch anywhere. That says to me that Apple's going to let the, the, the game developers, well, Gaming is weird on Apple, but the, the game developers and the app developers try to figure out how to make those experiences work properly. I'll say, like, again, in the roll up to it, like the way they were talking about gaming, the fact that they, you know, introducing another, they've got, they've got a whole development environment now that will emulate mm-hmm. Windows and then tell the developer where the code needs to go in order to do it, in order to write to metal. Like, they seem to be mm-hmm. getting more serious about that. Even in a, in a day and age when I think that cloud gaming is where it's definitely where even the regulators are more concerned about cloud gaming than they are about yeah. what what a what an individual device does. But if there's one thing that like the iPhone has taught Apple as a company is that they can't ignore gaming because it is incredibly lucrative and the gaming yes. market is not just you know the stereotypical you know it's not it's not just you and me. 
It's not just you and me. It's not just the Fortnite woman haters club, you know, exactly. like sh- shout, shout out to everyone who isn't a woman hater on, on Fortnite. <laughs> uh, there's a lot of you like, I'm, you know, I'm making, making fun stereotypes that are partly true. Um, but like th- that there's, that there's this whole, like, it came out this well, week that like more women own Nintendo switches than men. And apparently that pissed off. That pissed off gamers again, and it's like, come on, guys! Yes. Like, it's like, I mean, wait, but, but, but we, but we knew this since since Nintendo opened up that market with the, um, uh, you know, what I'm talking about um, the, the DS. first Nintendo device, uh, the DS, yes, but before the DS, um, uh, the the Wii, not before, not not the before the DS, the Nintendo Wii. Women were that was one of the first gaming consoles that women that women really took to. I love that you mentioned the Nintendo Wii because the thing I've been thinking about uh, like all last week uh, and, and into it because because into this week and, and thinking about like, you know, my feels about about the Vision Pro. So like, you know, something I would have liked to have seen was say Walkabout Mini Golf, right? Particularly because Walkabout Mini Golf, I just oh, talked to them. Love Walkabout Mini Golf. Love Walkabout. Oh, love we just it. talked to them and they've got Walkabout as as the creator told me, you know, it started out as a mobile game. Like they started out that thing as a mobile game and there's a mobile version of i think that's gonna, that's coming out that'll be walkabout mm-hmm. like on your iphone that will have cross play with the quest and so like we can be sitting there and like you playing the same thing you know even on different devices and and you sit there and you listen to that and the other question is like okay how do we do that without a controller and i started thinking about the yeah. wii and like how the yeah. wii had all those little peripherals that you stuck the wii mote into in a world mm-hmm. where the hand tracking works, all you need is like a fake go- mini golf it's like a, or, a fake or a bat. Yeah, or a something. bat. You want right. to do – no, we, they won't be able to do Beat Saber on the Vision because Meta owns them. But like – and you won't be able to yeah. do Supernatural, uh, which I think is maybe the great, the great crime because Meta bought within. But like yep. you want to do flow art stuff. You want to do boxing. You want to do mm-hmm. – you want to do – you know, I mean the nerf – gun game just got is getting shut down but like you want to do like a shooter you can do it with toys and 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 map those or, toys properly or let's not forget roblox right like yeah. let's not forget that entire world building genre mm-hmm. right like that that is going to be um uh you know like the the pokemon go style stuff like there's there's lots of things that become incredibly interesting when you get spatial right and this is, to me, what was exciting about the announcement wasn't all the things that it was missing because it was very clear that this was an MVP device, right? right? Like this is this was a minimum viable product, um, and it was also clear that Apple just doesn't seem like they know how users are going to want to use this thing yet. So they're giving it to developers, saying, "You guys know the users kind of better than we do. Figure that out." But like, I I think that if if they give developers the tools, if they if they get the basics right, the developers can figure out all of the different things that can be done with it. That's what has always happened. Yeah. And that's what will always happen. What does the ongoing legal war between Epic Games, makers of Unreal, and Apple do to this particular environment? Because Unreal is such a critical part of the gaming infrastructure, of the visual effects infrastructure, even more so. And, t- you know, TBH is still prettier than Unity, even though Unity is also, Unity's become like, you know, an 800 pound gorilla as well. Unreal is yeah. still Unreal. Unreal still looks better. Um, but uh, listen, Unreal, um, it's nice that they have Unity in there. It's nice that they have, it would be nice if they had Unreal in there as well. Um, But I honestly think it does nothing. Apple doesn't get much from Unreal because Mm. when you think about it, um, sorry, Apple doesn't get much from Unreal that it couldn't get from Unity. Um, And the reason why I say that is because like Unreal at the end of the day, it's, it's for the hardcore. 
right? Mm. Like Unreal Engine is used to make all kinds of hardcore games, but that's not Apple's bread and butter. That's never been their bread and butter. It's not ever going to be their bread and butter. So would it be nice if Unreal was was on good terms with Apple? Sure, it would be nice, but is Apple going to miss them? I doubt it. Like mm. all of the all of the developers who are Unreal developers are building amazing things, absolutely incredible, ridiculous, insane, out of this world things. But Apple doesn't need them because they're they're not going after the hardcore gaming base. They're going after a casual gaming base. They're going after um, they're going after people who are trying to build interesting experiences, and you don't need Unreal for that. You only need yeah. Unity, honestly, or you need whatever. Um, whatever APIs and SDKs that Apple is weaving into their own device. Those is there, I, I know some people, uh, you know, Alex Kalum is one of them. Um, I mean, Alex Kalum is them <laughs> who are working yeah. on pix, who are working on pixel streaming out of unreal to, to end devices. And then of course you have NVIDIA yeah. who are, you know, like <sighs> gods of, of the GPU and, NVIDIA just made the deal with Microsoft over getting, you know, Game Pass on the GeForce thing, which is all part of Microsoft's attempt yeah. to, like, get the Activision yeah. Blizzard uh, deal done, which the antitrust part of me doesn't want to happen. And the part that wants to watch Activision die and Bobby Kotick <laughs> to go off into the sunset is like, can we just do this one last mega merger and never another mega merger ever again? Please, everybody. <laughs> uh, Call of Duty is not that important, Europe. Just England. Just let it go. Uh, no one cares. Quit it. Um, get Bobby Kotick out of here. Um, I don't have strong <laughs> opinions about this at all. I, half my audience is like, who is he talking about? Who's Bobby Kotick? Exactly. Spelled K-O-T. No. Um, so the, the, the point I'm, I'm skirting around is there might be ways to get that unreal quality, like the visual quality of unreal without having to go direct onto device, even though that starts to get us into, you know, the metaverse that, you know, like thinking that, that is no longer in vogue. The point of that stuff really is so much of this stuff can be delivered server side, uh, and and it's really a question of how fat are the pipes. Although the pipes That's are still the, the pipes are still pretty not fat, and and maybe that, we're still yes. maybe we're still fifteen years of it has to be the device we're owning because the last mile isn't there. Yeah, and I, listen, the, the promise of the the promise of cloud gaming um, is one that. You know, like Sony right now is pushing their PS Now platform and like there are all these different platforms that are pushing some kind of cloud gaming play, but it's not amazing. Like I have tested it and I'm not, none of the games on there are games that I must have. So why do I care? I'll just buy, right? Rather than rent. Um, and for Apple's use case, um, for for the spatial computing for the spatial computing space let's uh, here's the thing here's one of the things about unreal that i think is going to hamper them in in this spatial computing space um granted they unreal is is really good at well just about everything but they are optimized for power intensive um gpus like mm -hmm. nvidia right mm -hmm. um and Get NVIDIA the 40, so boys. Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> like, are you going to be wearing an an NVIDIA chip on your face <laughs> so that it gets that hot? How big does the fan like, on your face have to be? I mean, that. video the NVIDIA video card is bigger than than a headset exactly straight up exactly exactly right yeah. and like and so like and and this is this is great for nvidia nvidia's ai play is going nuts right now and they're like you know their their gaming play is going really really well but there's a reason why apple came up with the m series processors because they needed something that was um that was able to handle uh all of the thing all the things Right from from productivity software to some level, some decent level of graphic intensity in, intensiveness, they needed that in a way that that was power safe, that wasn't a power monster. Yeah, and so like one of the things that I think 
Apple has essentially said here, sure, they're having a pissing match with Unreal. But in order to truly optimize their, like, in order to have Unreal truly optimize their stuff for the M-series processors, which is the future, their, the future computing platform, like, that's going to take some serious amount of money on, on Unreal's part. Apple's going to have to give them that money in order to do it. And I'm not sure that it makes sense for them financially to go through that yeah. when their market doesn't play hardcore games in the first place. I am still going to have a, a computer on my face and and a gaming device. It's yeah. going to happen. So I, I, why do I, I need it? I thought I was going to... I was getting out of consoles forever when mm-hmm. I built the the VR PC, which is how Your I VR went to, yeah. which is how I went to yeah. New Frontier and Tribeca, right? That it served no pro well for the past couple of years, um, and, and it's unlocked the the higher end VR and and you know let me play Jedi Survivor, right? Mm-hmm. But like, my God, the experience is so much better on a PS5 or an Xbox Series X. Um, and, and the only thing keeping me from getting Xbox series X is like, I know I, I should not spend the money on that right now. Uh, <laughs> but, but, but PC gaming, which, you know, I, I'd gotten convinced was like, I guess it's PC forever. It's such a bad experience in terms of the optimiz- optimization. And so, I, oh my I, God, I, it's so I, terrible. Like yeah, you have and, to be, you have, you have to be a super geek in order to actually like really do it right to to run a machine to run a a, a normal triple a game and exactly. like indie's a go-go which is great like i love that it opens up a whole world of indie games but you know mm-hmm. you don't need a 3070 which is what i've got you don't need a 3070 to run exactly. vampire survivor and if you did yes. need a 3070 to run vampire survivors then then the person making vampire survivors is doing a really bad job <laughs> you know like which which of course is part of the problem right it's the constant the constant uh code the the engineers use the affordances seemingly in sloppy ways because this uh-huh. escalation of what's necessary you know for for yeah. marginal improvements on some of the graphics stuff although when you get up to like a 4090 card Suddenly, you can turn all the ray tracing on. It looks, it looks you gorgeous. Can do everything, as hell, right? Yeah, you know. But, but that's why it's more like I, I was heavy into PC gaming, you know, um, back when I met you, and uh, even for a little bit afterwards. But at some point, it's like when I switched from, it's like when I switched from, um, from PC and Linux to Mac. It's not that I don't like them. It's not that I don't like the other platforms. It's just that at some point, I was like, you know, it's just easier to turn on my, my PlayStation. Yeah, just easier. Yeah, like I, you know, like every every five five years or so, I'll buy a new PlayStation. Every ten years or whatever, they'll update the they'll they'll update the platform to PS10 or whatever it is, and like that's the injectable the, one. That, that's is hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I, I just I just need it in me. I just need yeah. it in me. <laughs> um, no, but like at some point, people end up saying, "I don't want to keep up with this. Yeah. I, I shouldn't have to keep up with this." I shouldn't and, have to work to play. Exactly. Exactly. Right? And like and it's it's weird. I never saw myself as this person, but I have I have started to move my gaming budget from the AAA games, even though I'm still playing a couple at the moment, from the AAA games to like the mobile games. You know, yeah. like the my my regular spend now is no longer on the AAA games. I buy a few of those a year at least, maybe like five or six. Um, but I used to buy like two a month. You know, I, I buy like one, maybe two a year at this point. Like, I feel like I got conned into buying Elden Ring. And then once again, was reminded that like from soft and I just don't get along in terms of <laughs> like, I just, I can't do, I don't do animation based fighting games. I never have. It's just not how my brain yeah. works, even though I'd really like to, like, I love like it conceptually, to. but like, there's something about, I actually feel like it's something about the, the flatness and the abstraction of, of, of a game versus something that is more spatial. Yeah. Like the complexity of those animations is trying to recreate a spatial reality and recreate complex physical mechanics through button presses. And it's that disconnect between the abstraction of the physical. Like you, you put me in a VR yeah. version of, of, you know, dark souls. And I think mm-hmm. I might do better the same way that I know that, uh, I've always been good at flying games. Um, like better than I was ever at driving games, but 
you put me, you, you have me do Star Wars squadrons on a screen and I'm okay. You have me do Star Wars squadrons in VR and I'm scary. Like there's yeah. something about now I'm in a three dimensional yeah. space. There's, there's things I can do even, even though it's ultimately just all code is just something about being able to process it the, in that way. The, the, way the, the way your brain interacts with, yeah. with the 3d environment versus the 2d environment is very different, right? Yeah. Like that, I think that's or, what's or playing exciting. with a HOTUS ver- versus playing with a controller. It's exactly. less, it's less abstracted. Right. And, and that's the thing that exactly. excites me about spatial computing as, as a thing is less abstracted. Like m- there's more work to be done in order to make it a less abstract computing experience for everybody i just you know it's gonna sound weird but some as exciting as a a few things in the keynote were the most exciting thing to me was thinking to myself wait a second i can put my headset on it will have my three or four or ten windows up that is my desktop working environment, along with a movie that I'm playing in the background or whatever Apple TV Plus show that I'm watching at the moment, right? Playing in the background, it'll have all of that there. Um, and I could just have like a standing desk or work it, work in my living room or wherever it is. And like my environment is there. And then when I want to take it off, I don't, I can take it off. And you mean like, I don't need to have four monitors in front of me in order to do this? Like, so, I, I mean, over the past several years, I've been moving towards, and I haven't gotten there yet, but I've been moving towards doing all of my coding in the cloud, mm-hmm. right? Like, if I can use GitHub Code Spaces or anything like that, um, REPL, anything like that to, to build something, that's what I'm going to do. Because in the long run, I want to move towards only needing like not even, you know, only needing a MacBook, not a MacBook Pro, right? right? Only needing the bare bones minimum. I want to be able to know that when I turn on any computer I, I'm in front of, I can get my development environment back incredibly easily and then shut it down, right? So like the spatial computing vision that they showed in this moves more towards the cloud and it moves more towards me needing less devices, yeah. You know, like this is, this is what was exciting to me. I'm what I'm looking for out of spatial computing in terms of the compute side, not the experiential side, not, not, the, yeah. not, not that side yeah. is I want to get to the memory palace, not because I'm a big fan <laughs> of Sherlock, uh, which was visualized, but because I read Francis Yates's book about yeah the art of memory, the Ars Memoria, and and the way that, you know, Giordano Bruno and, you know, uh, you know, not, uh, who's the Roman orator, but the way the Roman orators used to use the Senate, used to use the forum and, 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 and draw things from in order to have this kind of, you know, really organic memory prompts. And and I think that some of that for me is rooted in the fact that if you if you're a spatial thinker, right? Like if you're someone who's drawn mm-hmm. to choreography, uh, to stage blocking, if you think theatrically, you already kind of have a natural tendency to do this. There's a reason to do why. This. Oh, da ah, ah, I'm getting hit by like 17 different uh, things at that's, once, just that's what I'm, blasting that's what it means my ears. To be an ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, um, four things hit a Facetime call all all the same all in the same breath. Um, it also reminded me that like, oh, I think I'm supposed to do a thing tonight uh, before I do another thing tonight. Suddenly, I have lots of things to do at night, uh, and it may drive me insane. <laughs> um, but I just got hit by the Facetime tone on three different devices at once. Um, sorry, everybody, but like this 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 I you know it was it, that that tradition of the Ars Memoria was was. Uh, preserved through theater over the course of the Renaissance. And some of those, some of those techniques were handed down through Shakespeare's theater. And there's just, um, someone's being really insistent. I think, let me pause real quick. I think, I think I know what this is about and it might actually be really important. So hold on a second. So everyone, everyone will get later. They will find out what that, that interruption was, the part that was cut. Uh, You'll hear that on a later episode, just so you know, To, to summarize what I was trying to get to the Ars Memoria 
uh, you know, it's it's just it's the earliest form of spatialized information management that people mm-hmm. have had, and it goes back to like Roman orators and before then, and people have been trying to create you know memory palaces in VR for for a hot minute here, and I gotta say that we go back to like the drop shadow on the windows, the detail mm-hmm. work that Apple does on the UI feels like the affordances yes. are there to create something like that uh, even though we're still in a flat language the the one thing i've been thinking about aside from hey can can something be developed out here or can it be used this way or can will people start to use it in that fashion to draw forth information like if i kept my like my reading list next to my my library in pass through like my physical library, like have like a, a sticky yeah. note in VR sitting there or, um, you know, it, it, you know, it, uh, is my, is my, are my recipe cards is my paprika app over in my kitchen, right? Like things of that nature where you start to like put the digital elements where they belong in the physical. And then the only real question I have beyond that is those shadows are they dynamically ingesting what the light sources are or are they going to be weird, creepy virtual shadows and not be responding in real time what the actual light sources are? That's, that's my concern, quote unquote. I'm, I'm going to guess that they have to respond to the lighting. Um, and the reason why I say that is because um, Apple's doing the exact same thing with sound, right? Yeah. So like yeah. It, it, it does – audio ray tracing essentially um, with the sound. So to believe that they're not dynamically doing stuff with the lighting, it, it doesn't, it doesn't sit well. It, it doesn't sound right. Yeah. Um, I, I, and I, I would, I would also yeah, argue that I would, like, I would agree that they've, they've got to be thinking about it if they haven't actually executed on it. Exactly. But I would also argue that like, um, you know, what you, what you just talked about there with the memory palace, yes, being able to put a recipe up over your stove um, and make sure that it always stays there. Like, that's a thing that I think can and should be done because you should be able to locate, a, to place something and locate it in space. But actually creating a memory palace is basically, um, is, is basically like Roblox and, and all these other world building things with combined with a bookmarking tool right like being able to create notes and um and not just notes but then actually like bookmarks and recipes and whatever else you want and create an entire mansion that you can that you can like that you can personalize that to me um sounds like what you're talking about and i don't know why that's impossible all right, as long as you have a good enough spatial computing platform, I don't know why that's impossible. But what it needs, and this is the last, this is like the last big thing. Um, Apple has an enormous advantage over Facebook or Meta. I will never not call them Facebook, by the way. Um, um, but, yeah. <laughs> um, um, yeah, like Apple has an enormous advantage over Meta. And that advantage is that Apple has essentially created an entire um uh, an, an entire user base that is dependent on them in a number of different ways and so when you have um when you have you know users like myself who are apple music users who utilize apple pay who um you know over six over 700 million people use siri actively right despite how bad it is um and like <laughs> i'm one of them and it's bad <laughs> you know it, it is bad but i still use it too and like you have you have an entire ecosystem of a billion plus users that are utilizing the applications on the platform and really interacting with um ios mac os ipad os so on and so forth by sharing bookmarks, keeping bookmarks, sharing, you know, messages, texting, all this other stuff, you have access to more content than Meta does, different types of content than Meta does, right? And not only that, you have different, you have access to different ways that people can consume it. Meta doesn't have Microsoft Word. Yeah. And it's just that simple, right? Just, I mean, I will say just the idea of taking all the notes that I've got 
you know, and, and, and notes hasn't even been my primary note keeping app all this time, but because it's the default, it's, not it's got either. 15 years worth of stuff in it that I just defaulted exactly. to, you know, I need something here and being able to turn that into stickies that live somewhere, being mm-hmm. able to like, like the, the question becomes for me, will this device allow us to map out more than one room's worth of space? Will it recognize where we are throughout a home and not just be bound to, you know, the the, the, the one space or the one room? There's there's a lot of questions. Why wouldn't that, it? I mean, it, only, it may, it may memory, not... only onboard memory, right? You know, like an uh, uh, ultimate, uh, the cache, the cache that gets set up, right? Is like the one thing I can think True, of. True, but... But let but uh, but let's just say that um, it, it, will will the MVP be able to do that? I have no idea. All right. Right. Um, but will the will the um, will the real product be able to do it? Almost certainly. Yeah. Almost certainly. Almost certainly. Right. Like, and that that's the thing. Right. Like, I I am making a distinction between this first device and the fourth device. Right. The right. the third or fourth device is where things start to get interesting. I don't know if you remember, but that very first iPhone that came out, it was two G. It was on AT and T only. Right. It, and it I didn't get. Didn't I didn't get until the three G. I think got the iPhone three was the first iPhone was, I got. Right. It was. I mean, like the, the first device was, was complete crap. Was I number seven in line at the Palo Alto store talking to Steve Wozniak? <laughs> Fuck yes, I was. But, <laughs> but but still, like that first device was crap. And I, I wholeheartedly expect that, um, that this, this first device, it's not necessarily going to be crap. It still looks pretty solid. Um, but it's not, it's going to be nothing like what it's going to be in like three or four iterations from now. Right. Like the, the, the ultimate question is, is there enough runway in terms of market interest for them to, to get that far? And, yes. and I mean, yes. All right. Oh, dude, like I, like. I'm sorry to cut you off, but I no, like, I know please. where that question is. I know where that question is going, and at, I think Apple sees this as their future, right? I am I am looking at every play that they've made. It doesn't make sense that they made the M series chips for laptops. It just doesn't, right? Like laptops were good enough before. Sure, they could get a little bit better, but. As you yourself have noticed, the difference between an Intel-based Mac and an M-series-based Mac is like night and day. It's just, it's not even in the same league, and it's only been a few years that this thing has been out. They didn't make that chip just to power computers. They made it to power new, entirely new experiences, which means they made it to power new devices. Yeah, I think their bet is this like they they don't want i think for one of the first times in a long time since not even the ipod really this is apple wants to define a new space normally apple comes in and refines things steals things does a little bit better does some refining so on and so forth right like no apple says i think all you vr people are doing this shit wrong we are going to define this space. And in order to do that, we needed this M series chip. They now have this R series chip as well in order to do this. Like they put things in place to lead up to this that tells me their investment in this means that they've got runway to do it, not counting their war chest of just cash sitting there. Right. But like they have made an investment in this. This is, this doesn't feel like something that they're going to say, you know what? Six years down the road, this isn't really working out. Screw it. They could have done that with the iPad, and they didn't. They're not too happy with the way iPad sales and everything like that are going, although they're not bad, but they're not great. Um, they didn't. This one, I think they're betting their future on it. I think this is a big bet for them, and I think that's the reason why they pushed it out early. Um, and by early, I mean like it's late according to them, but the developers – in, internally at Apple, I've heard scuttlebutt that they didn't think it was ready to be announced. Mm. So I, I would, but Apple, Apple made such a big bet on this that they had to put it out there. They had to start telling people that this thing actually existed, not just in rumors, but in like for real. I, I think there's enough runway for them. The, the harder part 
is going to be is going to be making sure that they move fast enough when users like you and me go and say, ooh, this device does this really well. Move in this direction. You know what they did with the Apple Watch? They need to be able to do that with this device. They need to be able to do that and they need to do it quickly um, so that they can increase the user base. Because I, like, if I buy this first Vision Pro, I'm not buying another one until like number three or four. Yeah. Right. I'm not gonna be able. To, nobody can afford. It. <laughs> nobody can afford it. So <laughs> yeah, that's. I mean, that, and that is to to go back to the the iPad metaphor, and then and then we'll we'll, we'll wrap because we we've been on this for a minute. Um, the iPad. I, I think we all know that one of the reasons why they're not happy with the way the iPad sales are is because people don't refresh their iPads the same way yeah. they refresh their phones because it's exactly. not as essential. And it'll be interesting yeah. to see with the vision if that ecosystem if that ecosystem matures as quickly as the iphone ecosystem does then that will drive some some churn there but because yeah. the device is so expensive you know the, the 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 amount of time you go between laptops and ipads are kind of the same and at this price point mm-hmm. probably the same you know for the the, yeah. the vision like it's you know, if you're a normal person who has heavy computing needs, you're probably on a five year cycle with your laptop. You you ride the laptop yeah. until until you until cannot take it anymore, and then you switch to the new one and you start the clock and you know that in five years you're gonna have to drop that money again and you kinda don't want to. Having mm-hmm. just lived through that cycle myself, right? <laughs> um and it, and and I feel the same is gonna be true. As opposed to what Meta's doing, where it's it's the cheapest box they can make to slur on your face. Exactly. And and if you're on a two year console cycle, you know, like you're, you're you're basically you're kind of like uh you're iPhoning it, you know. Listen, I I love Meta for what they did for the space, right? Like they they brought new users into the space. Um, hell, like um, my mom's best friend has a Quest, and we play Beat Saber. Right, like I, I play Beat Saber with like a seventy-year-old woman, and <laughs> sometimes she kills me. Oh um, my god! <laughs> um, but like, I love Meta for what they did, um, but Meta pigeonholed themselves with the Oculus, um, and that is that like they turned it into a gaming device and not an, an. And this is because of who Meta is. Like, this is just who they are. Um, they turned it into a. a into a, a, a one uniform device. Apple is trying to make it, I don't want to say all things for all people, but a much more general use device so yeah. that so that my mother can use it for her computing needs and I can use it for my very different than her computing needs. And if somebody wants to watch Avatar on it, the way it was meant to be watched, although for the record, I still haven't watched any of them <laughs> because I always thought it was a gimmick, but you know, like somebody wants to watch Avatar on it, that's great. And like looking at the sports potential for this, huge, like, huge, massive, absolutely huge. Maybe like, the number one well, thing I was shocked that they didn't show off that they they clearly showed to people behind the scenes, but didn't put in the sizzle reel. Is, like oh, that's you. Jesus. You do you put people on the goal line. You put people in the stands, and oh and maybe it becomes a threat. The thing is, like those tickets are so expensive as they are, you know, yeah. it 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 becomes worth it. It becomes worth it. It totally to becomes worth it, right? Yeah, like it, it like it, and it, it's one of the it's one of the calculations I make right now. I I have a good enough sound system and so on and so forth that sometimes there's a movie I want to see in the theater, but I don't want to see it enough in the theater to get out to get out of the house to go do it. I was like, you know what? I'll buy it on Apple TV Plus. It just came out in the theater last week. Great. Let me let me buy it. It's twenty dollars, thirty dollars, or whatever. It's a cost of two two tickets. Fine, right? Like it's the same mental process will go through my mind when I want to watch a Yankees game. The exact same mental process, and I'll yeah. say, "You want you want to put me down at first base for forty fifty bucks? Yeah, I, I would I would do that all day. And if like ninety percent of that ends up going to MLB so that they don't, or ends up going back to the Yankees." I mean, like, imagine what it could do for the teams, right? Like, yeah. for the teams to have that kind of virtual revenue coming in, that would be interesting. Because right now, I don't really care to watch baseball on TV. Um, 
it's okay. Like I watch the big stuff, but if I could, if I could actually feel like I'm there, yeah, yeah, I would, I would do that a lot more. That's that, that dimension to it. That's, that's the real game changer. If they nail that and Apple does have, it's, it's clear there's going to be a play with MLS. Messi's coming yep. to Miami. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's clear in my mind, it seems like a no brainer that there'll be something around concerts or, and I'd be much more excited than concerts, something around music videos in this yeah. format that cannot be accomplished well, in, in, in other formats. That's where well, it there was exciting that, to me. A- Apple tried that out is trying that Apple music video now um, thing. Now that's like a, an MTV wannabe, you know, yeah. um, it, it's not great. Um, every so often I'll turn it on and watch, but I, like it could, there could be some really, really interesting things that happen there. Um, lastly, before we go, um, I was super fascinated by the fact that Bob Iger came out on stage. I mean, I'll tell you until Bob came out, like there wasn't anything that Apple was showing that even hit some of the basic notes of immersive entertainment for me. And what Bob showed is still just a fraction of what ILM immersive has already created, right? Mm -hmm. Like Disney, Disney already has way more stuff, uh, way more complicated things. They, they kind of just hit the basic notes you know, there was nothing even as complicated yeah. as Trials on Tatooine. There was nothing as complicated as, mm-hmm. you know, the demo I saw at at the X Lab back when they were still called the ILM X Lab, you know, five years ago that yeah. had BB-8 rolling into the room, right? Like, pass through with Disney characters. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. I did a pass through experience. I talked about it on the on the last show, Monst- Monster Pol- uh, Monst- mm-hmm. Monster Rama, and the thing I was telling the people yesterday about about it was that even though the oculus quest is is black and white pass through because yeah. of the way my brain works because the the elements were color i just sort of saw my room in color it's back like when i was a little kid watching black and white television like if i knew what the colors were supposed to be my brain colorized it and so having pass through characters in your physical mm-hmm. space in a way that feels really well done that doesn't feel weightless that feels like they're actually there that 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 maps it well mm-hmm. that is a holy shit moment and well, to do that with disney characters and and to get into that whole realm right that is a big potential here the question of course being will a ma- will a company that is as obsessed with scale as disney ha- give the runway for their creatives to do that interesting work when that company has also killed off things like the Disney toy box game, Disney infinity, right? Like that's, that's where the rubber meets the road on this is what, what are the deals being made? Apple has deep pockets. Can they buy some cool stuff from Disney and, yeah. and just, and, and, and that be the trend, the B2B transaction that allows that stuff to exist in the consumer market, as opposed to a, a D to C move, um, which, which would require big, big scale right from the start. I completely, I agree with you a hundred percent on that one, right? Like Disney does, does require scale. They go for scale, but they also go for innovation. Right, like yeah. innovation is a big deal to them, and so I, I think, despite the fact that the initial sales projections on this are literally under a million, uh, under a million units, um, I think if they can prove, if Apple can prove that this is a truly innovative platform, I think Bob is going to look the other way for scale in the short term. Yeah, no, I, and I think I th- I think there's there's a there's a road here, right? Like they're they're not. I'm just doing some quick math. Uh, you know, the, the fun thing about this is that if they sell a million units, it's a 3.5 billion market, right? Exactly. Right from exactly. Jump, right. Like that's, is, that's, is, that's, that's the advantage still, of the Apple tax, you know? Like, I was about to say. <laughs> yeah. And it, it's still a round, it's still a rounding error for Apple, but it's still, um, yep, I mean, they're yep, a trillion yep. dollar count, but, yeah. but it's, you know, like it's, it's not insignificant and it's also a rounding error for Disney to be honest right like yeah um but but just to but we give need you some rounding like, errors in our favor <laughs> yeah we do right but just, just to like give you some numbers like in 2008 when the iphone launched there were 10 million units sold in that first year 
right? Um, there are 10 million units active in that first year. Now there are 1.3 billion active yeah. Yeah. in 2022. Right. Well, like, I, I think that's been the problem with VR this entire time is that like people have been looking at the numbers and like we've been in the BlackBerry era this entire time. Yes. And now maybe we are yes. entering the iPhone era, but then people forget that the iPhone era didn't start out as the iPhone era. It didn't. Right? It didn't. Yeah. There's there's a lot of road to it. Uh, Kurt, I feel I feel much like Batman and the Joker. We're going to be doing this forever. And I guess as I said, I guess I became the Joker in that moment. Uh, but um, but yeah, we'll 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 circle back around at least when like the the, the next announcement comes. If if not talking about something else uh, between between here and then. Uh, but I look forward to it. Thanks yeah. for having me. I appreciate no. it. Oh, thanks. Thanks for hopping on the pod and doing this and, and everybody you'll, you'll, you'll get the uncut version, uh, in not too long. It'll all, it'll all make sense. <laughs> oh, actually, hold on. Kurt, if people, uh, social media is all broken up these days, but like, is there any place that you hang out that if people want to like, kind of like follow, follow along? Uh, yeah. A good place? yeah. So you can find me on, um, you can find me on blue sky. If you are part of the, the few that are there. I am. Um, I didn't know you're on Blue Sky. What's your handle, I, dude? I, I I am the same handle most places. Time Sync. T I M E S Y N C. Um. So you can find me on Time Sync on most places. Or, there you are. Um, Why haven't I followed you yet on Blue Sky? I'm now following you on Blue Sky. Boom. Go. I'm your 25th follower. No, I'm your yes. yeah. No, no, I'm your 13th follower. Sorry. Uh, and and you know what? S- Satan is one of them. So you know, like, <laughs> Satan follows everybody on there. that platform. So like, let's just be <laughs> Satan and Anonymous are the two major followers. This is exciting. Uh, we're on Blue Sky. No pros on Blue Sky. You go at No Presidium, and we're on Blue Sky. Yes. Meow Wolf is now, now on Blue Sky. You're welcome. Yes. Uh, we did that. Uh, they haven't posted anything yet, but you know, um, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can find me most places also on you know Twitter and stuff as as Time Sync. Or also, if you're ever looking for me, I am the only Black Kurt Collins on the internet. So <laughs> like, you can find me on LinkedIn. Just type in Kurt Collins and look for the black guy, and I swear to God, that's me. You shouldn't <laughs> love it on one level, but on another level, I do. So there, there you go. Like, accept no substitutes, especially if they're white. So on that note, Kurt, always a pleasure to talk to, with you. And uh, we're overdue for, for some Beat Saber. So uh, we'll get that. Excellent. Into. Once again, I want to thank Kirk Collins for being our guest on the show and for enduring my monologues. Jeez, Louise. Anyway, (laughs) it's all it's like the first thing in the morning uh, because Kurt's in Lisbon, uh, which is the same as London. And I I have less of a filter in the morning. It's it's true. It's awful. Um, Look, you've had a lot of me today. Uh, The show is like an hour and 17 minutes long right now. So I will spare you. But indeed, uh, the audio that got cut from this episode uh i've got it it's hanging around uh you won't get to hear it now uh you will get to hear it or at least a version of it uh because i listened to it again last night i was like oh eh, maybe not that part um you'll get to hear it not next week uh only because i, I don't want to jinx myself but the week after that's that's when we're going to pop that sucker out into the great uh, zone of, of the ether, of the inner ether net. Anyway, I knew they said ethernet, which marks me as a very particular kind of nerd. But anyway, let's get to the credits. I want to like spoil things. There's a bunch of stuff. I want to tell you what's, I, I really want to tell you what's going on. And, and I do, I do not want to, I don't want to jinx it. No, I, I didn't win the lotto yet. I'm working on it. By working on it, I mean diligently using $2 a week. Um, reasonable. I feel that's reasonable. Um, risk reward. Better than if I put all my money into Doge. Uh, <laughs> never touch crypto for that reason. Uh, now if I put a bunch of money in Bitcoin like 15 years ago when I met Kurt, if I'd, if I'd gotten Kurt to tell me how to make uh, anyway, let's let's not go there. Uh, the coffee is at least hitting today. I want to thank uh, so many people right now, uh, but we'll we'll keep it for now to the oh my god I'm 
so I'm, I'm, I'm like vibrating here. Uh, we'll keep it to the staff uh, who helps with the show at the moment. So the show, uh, the associate producer, I can barely speak today. Oh man. The associate producer of this podcast is Parker Sella. Music for No Persinium is by Chris Porter of the Speakeasy Society and Solar the Podcast. Special thanks to Siobhan O'Loughlin for voicing our intro. And this mess is my fault. I am Noah Nelson. And until next time, oh, I'll see you at the show. <laughs>